Road Less Traveled with Gary L. and Gigi's Boo on reallibertymedia.com, RLM Radio. 701, I was watching the chat room for the queue and it didn't come up till a minute later. That's okay. It's February 18th, 2018, 2118, if you look at it Pythagorean ways. So what's going on with everybody? Hi, Gigi's Boo, how are you? Well, I've been yawning, and you said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bore you. You don't bore me. I just was sleepy, and I told Graham in the chat room, I said, if I yawn, it's because I'm sleepy. Don't have no idea why. Yeah, I said, Kim, I've been sucking in too many chemtrails. That's what it it. is. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of which, though, I actually have had several trees just fall over here recently, within the last two, three months. And I go look at them, and they got no roots. The roots have disintegrated. And what I mean, we're really we're not, scary. That's we're not scary talking, when you think about that. Yeah, we're not talking about old trees. We're talking about one of them was relatively young. And I'd noticed later in the year that it looked a little sickly. The next thing I know, I'll walk outside and it's laying over and it basically looks like an amputee stump is what it looks like, the base. Mm. <laughs> Grim was snoozing too. Oh, yes, yeah, I'm sleeping trails. too. Yeah, but Grim, there. If you're wondering who that is, if you didn't know, he's the uh, head guy here at RealLibertyMedia.com. dot com. He's the one that keeps all this all this good stuff going on, uh, five thousand years worth of archives. <laughs> Actually, about let me see. We're we're right at that at that ten year anniversary. I think almost just about on the eighteenth of February. Yeah, 10 years, Gigi's. Where does time go? It flies. When, when you're having so much fun, you see, getting bombed by chemtrails and irradiated by electromagnetic waves and all, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But yeah, so what's been going on on your side, Gigi's Boo? I mean, we just had a Valentine's Day, didn't we? Oh, we did. And it was wonderful. I'm the type of woman that doesn't require diamonds and jewelry or anything like that. I had been on the look. I, probably everybody in here already knows I like to cook. I'm a very domesticated woman. I like everything about home. Cooking, sewing, canning, crocheting, you name it, I love it. I love home. And I had really wanted the Good Housekeeping First Edition cookbook. It was first printed in 1953. And I looked and looked and looked and couldn't find it anywhere. And then there was another one that was uh, printed, I believe, in 69. And then through the years, periodically, they've updated some of them, but none of them had the original recipes like 53 did. Well, guess what? I got both those cookbooks for Valentine's Day, and I was just screaming and jumping up and down and having a fit because Gary had gotten me those cookbook and my friend said didn't that piss you off I said oh no (laughs) far from that he couldn't give me anything any better so I guess he's kind of glad I'm that type of a woman I'm not a flashy woman or anything like that I kind of more laid back I can dress up I can be a girly girl I'm all woman but uh, I like to cookbooks and sewing machines. Gary, the last count we had of my sewing machines, didn't we count that I had 16? Yeah, something like that. 16 sewing machines. <laughs> and how many and Somebody them? said, what are you doing with them? I said, well, I play with all of them. I mean, you know, I've got all these things and I've got a room full of cloth and I've got a heat press and I have, what else have I got, Gary? I've got I got all kind of good stuff. You got, I got, the, all you got kind the, of the Dremel stuff. tools. Don't forget about that. The what now? The, the Dremel what? tools, and you have the oh yeah, the glass yeah, I, etching, and you got the sand blaster. And yeah, oh. I got I got a sand blaster, and I've got Dremel tools that I can etch with. And Gary asked me one year. He said, "Honey, what am I going to give you for Christmas?" And I said, "Well, I'd like to have some of those wood drills." That mm-hmm. you put on the end of a mm-hmm. drill and mm-hmm. spade bits. Spade, yeah, spade I didn't bits. know what to call them, but he knew because I had used them. Then I said, "What else did I want? Dremel tools. Mm-hmm. I want the diamond bits." And he got those for me and everything. So, I'm I, Valentine's Day was wonderful. 
Gary L. does love to eat frumpy. He likes good food, and he's well fed, but he likes to cook, too. Now, I was just going to say, I'm no stranger to yeah. running a kitchen, so. Yeah, Gary likes to cook, too, and Gary can help me run a lot of equipment here, too. You know, when we get going, he can run a lot of it. And it's so funny, I'll automatically, something will come into my mind, because I am creative, and I'll say, Gary, get a piece of paper, write this down. Because when I write, I just kind of, being a nurse, kind of chicken scratch. And then I go back and I can't read it. And I said, Gary, write this down. And I'll write down. And then he gives me a list of what all I've thought of. Then I go back and create it. So, yeah, I'm kind of that way. But Gary loves to cook. He even helps can and put up food and stuff like that. So we sort of like the same thing. And he likes time pieces. And he likes, um, you name it, he likes all kind of things like that. But I guess you could call us gadget people. Yeah. We like all kind of gadgets. And, and you mentioned timepieces. and uh, You've gotten me this very, very nice, actually antique by antique standards, uh, gold Mickey Mouse watch. What well, mm-hmm. about that? I yeah. ran in there and paid on that for six months mm-hmm. uh, for Christmas. I went in and I saw it and it caught my eye. And I put it back. He loves timepieces and he displays them. So I asked the lady, I said, how much? I said, can I make payments? And she said, sure. So I made payments in Cotty. Yeah. You got to sandblast that cloth size in this right. Yeah, and talk, talking about cloth, I mean, I don't know if folks remember this or not. And by the way, Grimner said in the chat room that the 21st of Fe- years. February is 10 year anniversary. That's a decade. That's a, yep. that's a decade. I mean, back when we were a little bitty kid, I used to think, that. We were really young. A decade? Okay. That's, that's like ancient history. <laughs> that's right but yeah I mean I remember the time when, when you negotiated with those Chinese people about a whole bunch of cloth oh yeah already the tea towels and everything yeah and... but but before you start let me let me advise people that this is instructive so you know there are places you can go and even though they want to try to tell you that you have to order one million items in order to get a good deal That's not true. And let Gigi Spoot tell you why. Well, when you contact China, those people over there work for pennies. Therefore, they sell it for pennies. And what you would pay for a tea towel here. And I'm all for, I'm all for buying U.S. made stuff. But at the time I was buying this, this was when all of our textiles had closed down where they were not making it here anymore. I gave 70 cent a tea towel for that and so they told me they said thousand pieces and I said no 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 I'll get back to you on that well they kept dickering with me through um email uh how many did you want and I said so and so and so and they say they they they're selling it cheap but what catches you is you're shipping and paying your customs and so I just told them I said I got a factor in shipping I've got a factor in customs And all this, so dickering back and forth, you don't have to give them their price. And Gary, I tell you, I'm the queen of bartering. I'll stand and barter and walk away and I'll come back, come back, come back. You know, no, uh uh, no. And all this, and I just, you know, finally I got it really, really cheap. And I went online and Gary and I looked, and these people that are selling these things for three and four dollars online, they're reselling them. They got them the same place that mm-hmm. I got mine, mm-hmm. but look at the markup. And I said, you know, I couldn't do that. And so you don't have to always take what they first tell you, and especially like at a, at a flea market or a yard sale or something like that. You can dicker with them. I like to dicker. You know, we did, I think we did a whole show one time on bartering some yeah. things that we bartered here, like for produce and I did some sewing and then man fixed our brakes one time for some sewing and some he needed a pair of glasses and these were just drugstore glasses but you just keep things that you can barter with I like to barter a lot better than I like to exchange monetary value I don't like to do that monetary is this that's crop with me okay I'll shut up now no that's okay you even have to watch out though because if you get heavy into bartering, sometimes 
people will take notice of that and try to slip someone in on you. Now, that oh, ha- that happened to us, too. Yeah, that's, that's why I was leading up to. Go ahead and talk about that. I had a stranger. We had we didn't keep the gates locked at, because we were in and out. Had somebody knock at the door, and this gentleman was there, and he wanted to know if I would be interested in making his children's clothes for, I can't remember now what he wanted to barter for. What was it, Gary? I can't remember. But mm, something no. something just didn't no. set right in my stomach. And I said, well, now I really don't have that much time. I, it was maybe like produce or something. And he said, I'd like to see the cloth that you're talking about, you're, you know, that you would use. And I said, I didn't tell you I was going to use anything. And I headed him off at the door. When I told Gary, Gary said, well, what did you do? Because Gary wasn't here at the time. And I just said, I didn't tell him I was going to do anything because something didn't set right with me. And I fully believe that man was a plant that was coming in here to, you know how people do. They'll call and tax people and yeah, all this other the tax stuff. Man. <laughs> yeah. So we didn't, we didn't go that route. Never did see the guy again either. I told him, I said, get back in touch with me. Let me talk to my husband. And I said, Get back in touch with me. Never got back in touch with us. Mm-hmm. So, so you have to you just, have to watch out. I mean, it's it's a sad it's a sad reality that governments will do all they can do to harvest you and make sure that you don't get anything over on them. That's why I'm a little bit surprised that more proactive measures about online purchases haven't been implement it as far as sales tax goes and all that well you know now if you buy something from amazon they they figure in how much your tax would be yep and um amazon is under a lot of scrutiny gary tell them about what happened to you and then i will go in and tell them what i read on online yeah and i might have mentioned this already in fact i know i have when i said i've kind of sworn off amazon because I start, I've been receiving these, uh, I had been receiving these unsolicited packages. They were mailed to this address, to my name. And when I challenge the customer service about who made the order, one occasion they wouldn't tell me. But on the other occasions, they gave me the name of these um, account holders, Amazon account holders, that it was just some code name. I'm sitting there thinking, what in the world is going on with this? Because I wouldn't open them. I'd turn them around and send them back. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know how widespread this was, but Gigi's book actually get, discovered that it's a little more common than I thought. Go ahead. Yeah, they, there was several people, in the, not several, let's say a lot of people in the United States who were getting all these unsolicited packages from Amazon. And they didn't order anything. And when they call to try to return it, they're just saying, well, it was just sent by mistake or this, that, and the other. The man said, I'm not, one man said, I'm not keeping anything that I didn't order. And so they return it. Now, what happened to Gary and I, I don't know if I went into it about our sofa. We ordered a sofa off of Amazon and it didn't come and it didn't come and it didn't come. And I did a check on it. And they said it was delivered to our house and somebody gave us, they gave us a name who was supposed to sign for it. I said, well, it's not here and we didn't order it. And no, we ordered it and it's not here. So I told them to turn around and send a replacement. Well, I watched the credit card real, real careful because you don't know what they're going to do. Well, sure enough, the sofa came in, nice little sofa, had it up. And that afternoon, here come another FedEx truck up with another sofa exactly the same way and I said I'm not taking that and he said did you not order it and I said they've already brought it he said when did they bring it I said they brought it this morning and he looked at me the FedEx driver looked at me so puzzled and he said well you can take it and leave it on your porch and call and tell them to come get it I said no I'm refusing it and so he brought the ticket up and I had to sign that I refused it and it went back. Well, when I called, they gave me a complete runaround 
that it was the post office mistake. Then they said it was the post office said it was Amazon's mistake because it was sent back to Amazon. How did it ever go back to Amazon when it was in route here? What Gary and I figured out is somebody was going to steal that sofa and just keep it and say that they delivered it. And we were going to have to end up paying for two. But they're saying now that the latest thing that's going to take place is Alibaba. That's the place where you go to find everything you want from China. And you can buy most anything you want, but you have to buy it in bulk. I checked with Alibaba the other day just to see. They used to have a minimum piece of, say, like 500 to 1,000. Now you can order a lot less than that. Amazon's getting ready to take a downfall. In some way, shape, or form, it's getting ready to. But I don't order anything from overseas anymore. Our economy's picking up. Some of the mills are beginning to operate, and I want to buy American-made. You're going to find crooks everywhere you go. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And it's just, it's crazy. I mean, I don't know what is up with the Amazon thing. But, of course, we've mentioned also that Walmart has actually surpassed Amazon in online sales. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if you Free delivery, it, too. Yeah. If you, no, char- that, no charge and, for delivery. And that's one of the things that, that is driving it, because there's no particular minimum for free delivery. Of course, it's all factored in, it's spread across all the pricing, of course. But when you have economy of scale, you can kind of get away with that. So you kind of make it look like you're getting a great deal. And in fact, comparatively, I suppose you are. And Frumpy says he likes Alibaba. Alibaba is pretty cool. And one of the things about that is there are large numbers of sellers that work through Alibaba yeah. on the very same items. Okay, so whatever major government factory factory that makes these items and then parses it out to all these different sellers, but they're in direct competition with one another as well. So what happens with your shipping and even the, and your minimum requirements? Why well, you might be able to talk them down to a smaller number, but you'll probably wait a little longer to receive it because what they'll do is aggregate enough to fill a small container. Okay, so they fill that small container, it goes on a ship and comes over and gets split up and so forth and, and forwarded from there at a freight forwarder. So yeah, if you're into different things and you can you can look through Alibaba and they have lots and lots of stuff, especially electronic equipment, of course, most Frump, of it. Frumpy just said they have Alibaba Express now. So uh, they do their own shipping, Frumpy. Yeah, yeah. Talk talk about that, Frumpy. And I'll take a minute for you to tell, tell us. Tell up. us about that prompting. Tell us about the Alibaba Express. Yeah, but yeah, that's um, that's a great thing. I mean, I've looked at amateur radios, being an amateur radio guy, and you can actually purchase. Then they're they're already they're already being made there to begin with. So they used to, a lot of them used to be made in Japan, Kenwood, and so forth. Yeah, mm-hmm. Yezu and all that it was made in Japan. Now much of it's made in China, and so obviously you're get, you're getting the very same product. A lot of people complain, a lot of the old-timers, I guess, complain about the Baofeng handheld radios. I mean, they're like 30 bucks for a dual-band handheld 5-watt radio. And <laughs> compared to some of the others, they're like $150 that are. They're still made in China. That's the part that, I don't know, that's part of the argument that I don't, I don't quite get. They're all made in China now, but... The old timers will beat up on Balfang, saying they they aren't up to standard, and perhaps they might. They probably are. So cut some corners, cut in the production in order to keep the prices down. But you're going to try to tell me that uh, a, a name brand, let's say, handheld radio is five times better than a Balfang because you're spending five times more. I don't think so. I don't think that's the case. I'm not sure I quite gather. I think I get what you're saying, Frumpy. Uh, one PC instead of five thousand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, they've they're evolving. What's the barking going on? What's all that barking? Uh, that's Atticus, you know. Somebody Attica. barks that size. I guess to show his uh, rear. The mayor, the mayor. He's got to he's got to make a proclamation. Anyway, we're some kind of rambling, <laughs> rambling around here on different things. Probably need to get onto the storyline storyboard. Atticus. Come on, Atticus. 
Cut it out. <laughs> well, she doesn't get in there face to face with. We've the... got a chorus going on outside. They're, yeah. they're, they start at night. He yeah. goes out and he, they like to talk and holler at each other all over. Mm -hmm. About a five mile radius. Yeah, I want before we get into, I got a lot of kind of different things. They're all basically preparation oriented to one degree or another. But here's one that's a little bit off the board, and people like to beat up on Facebook. Well, guess what? Just came across on Reuters on the 12th of February that a German court ruled that Facebook use of personal data is illegal. Ooh, you didn't hear about that anywhere else, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, out of Berlin, a German consumer rights group said on Monday that a court had found Facebook's use of personal data to be illegal because the U.S. social media platform did not adequately secure the informed consent of its users. Hmm, informed consent. That's not a phrase you hear very often these days. <laughs> But it's a very important phrase, and it's one you have to keep in mind. That means uh, that Facebook will face increasing scrutiny over its handling of sensitive personal data that enables it to micro-target online advertising. So, it's a pushback from the Germans saying, well, you know, if you're going to advertise, you have to tell people more directly, and they have to agree to you doing that. And, of course, Facebook intends to appeal, even though several aspects of the court judgment has been in its favor. It said it had already made significant changes to its terms of service and data protection guidelines since the case was first brought in 2015. Probably so. I expect they did. I'm glad they did. They're grim there. They see, there's two of us thinking alike. They heard about it on Freaker's Ball as well. So that's good. I guess I missed that. My apologies. But I don't guess it, it doesn't hurt to bring it up again. Informed consent. Wow. That's one of the problems we have today overall, I think. And actually, Hal was talking today in his show, Behind the Woodshed, that runs from 3 to 5 on Sundays here on reallibertymedia.com. He was talking about the Florida shooting case, you know, so, so many people are talking about. And one of the things... Things I think one of the key things he brought up was the fact that, I don't know if these are court-appointed attorneys, maybe he can clarify that for me, but the attorneys, attorneys, rather than try to take any type of legal defense tactics or anything, just rolled over, threw the guy under the bus and said, no, the best, basically the best we can hope for is try to avoid life in prison for this juvenile. That's kind of a sellout, and he points to the fact that it seems that no one wants to bring up, they don't want to talk about pharmaceuticals. They don't want to talk about depressed people who are being treated with pharmaceutical drugs, and which by their own admission in their black box labeling will tell you that going off the deep end and hurting other people is a potential side effect. But we don't want to put that on trial. We'd rather roll over. Something to think about. But what was interesting, I noticed <laughs> while he was actually giving, during his show, I was reading an article that came off a, an NBC.com site stating unequivocally that there was no direct evidence of school shootings and pharmaceuticals having an effect on those. Well, no, no kidding there, Einstein. If you don't look into the issue, there obviously won't be any report of it, will there? Even though family members and others in the know have said in nearly every case that these people were either recently under psychiatric care or mental health care receiving psychiatric drugs or were presently receiving psychiatric drugs. But you see, this issue never, ever, ever comes out in court. The system will not put Big Pharma on trial. I wonder why that is. <laughs> As a rhetorical question, of course. What are your thoughts on that, Gigi? Boo? You've been around that sort of thing. Oh, gosh. They're not... You know, everywhere you go, they're, they're automatically going to say, 
depression, depression, you need something to keep you from being so depressed. And they push it. And I don't know. Okay, let me give you something else, too, that's uh, kind of odd. The range for normal blood sugar ran on two scales. It ran from 70 to 110 or 80 to 120, depending on your doctor. Now, they want you to keep it around about 60. People would be falling over. Okay, the meters that you use to check your sugar now to an older meter that I had, I compared them. My new meter reads my blood sugar higher than my older meter does. Why? Because they want you to take the insulin. They're pushing the drugs. You know, the first thing that you hear when you've got a child that's free-spirited, as I want to call it, oh, they need to be medicated. They need to get them on medication. You need to do this, this. True, there's some children who do probably need to be medicated. But there's other ways that you can do it. I just disagree with all this antipsychotic medication, all this depression medication. Haldol was the going thing, wasn't it, in about the 70s? And now, if you look at somebody who has taken Haldol a long time, they sit with their tongue hanging out and they drool. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just an after effect of the medications and what it does to you. I don't take, I take very little, and they had really wanted me to take a whole lot at one time. And thank God my mother and my doctor put a stop to that, and I'm thankful for that. They didn't let that take place. And I read an article today about elderly in nursing homes. 90% of the elderly that are in nursing homes are on depression medication. And all it does and are some kind of nerve pill. And why they do that is they dumb them down. It's a chemical restraint because they don't hire enough people to take care of them. It's terrible. It's terrible. I don't know what this place is coming to myself. I really don't. Yeah, but the bottom line here is, and I think you make a very good point, that it's all part of a, of a, of a control paradigm. And also, it's a part of a profit paradigm. The less you spend, the more you make. So if you can insert wholesale purchased antipsychotic medicine in order to provide controls over people, and make them more manageable, if you will, then you'll have to spend less money on staffing. Okay? So that's part of it. But bottom line here is that you're, when you have side effects that affect a a predictable group of people or percentage of, of those people. When you have those side effects, the more people that are medicated, the more side effects that you will experience. I mean, that's just common sense. Do you know how they test medication and see if it's how they prove side effects and death with medication? Go ahead. And the, the average. Okay, any medication you take, be it antibiotics down to nerve pills down to what they sleep you with when they do operation it's all run guinea pig type people they try it on so many people say 500 people and out of that 500 people they say has there been any deaths from the medication has there been any side effects itching shortness of breath different things and they take that in and it's only about 500 people that they test it on so when they take you to put you to sleep, they're taking a medication that's, if it's relatively new, it's not been used that much. You're taking a chance. I get really pissed off at FDA. They're supposed to be, oh, top notch. That's crock. That's a crock. And it really frightens me to think that we're run, we're like guinea pigs were used as guinea pigs. And let me tell you something. I have been working in nursing homes and they would do a study and you were to give these patients, all these patients, this certain medication and it was taped up and you didn't know what you were giving them. And as a nurse, I refused to give it. 
A nurse does not have to give any type of medication that she does not feel comfortable giving. So I refused. Speaking of informed consent, right? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, so this thing is a lot broader and taller than a lot of people would like it to be. And, of course, the the uh, the immediate anti-gun mantra comes out, ban, 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 you know, so forth and so on. When, I mean, the logic of that is, well, the absence of logic is self-evident. For those who do any kind of thinking at all, what they're actually trying to promote is some kind of band-aid that does not address issues. Now, I like to do a lot of reading, and one of the things I like to study is, is political science and the philosophy thereof. And so most recently I'm reading a book right now that is um, basically the philosophy behind the concepts of government. And I guess more directly it's a philosophy of societies behind that the causative factors within societies and groups of people. And I think this writer makes a very excellent point. He points out that probably the greatest motivator of people is the concept of recognition. Humans like to be recognized. So they have different ways of gaining that recognition. For example, back in the day you had the warrior class. Now the warrior class obviously wanted to be recognized for their prowess in battle. One of the odd things about humans is that they will put their lives in danger in order to gain this recognition, unlike uh, many others. In fact, back in the American Indian experience, counting coup, that was a function of recognition, right, Gigi Spoo? We go out and touch the enemy? Yeah. Yeah, it's not a, a deadly thing. You're basically showing your bravery, and you will be recognized by riding up or running up in the face of the enemy and just touching them and then going away. That was called counting coup. So this is all. This is actually heading in a direction. So when we look at our situation in our society and the fact that we have an unbridled fiat currency that has, as we've talked about in the past, my belief, it has thrown the entire society out of balance. It has thrown people out of whack with too fast, too greatly increased, I can't say this right, the greatly enhanced levels of technology that we have not developed as a species, we have not sufficiently developed yet in order to incorporate those into our lives appropriately. I don't know how else to say that. We've been driven ahead in the, for the sake of profit and control and assets to try to incorporate all this noise, this technological noise, into our lives. And that has a bad effect on people, by and large. In one of these articles that came up in Common Dreams, headlined, it says, Fueled by Broken Social Contract, Study finds inequality and despair drives now the U.S. life expectancy. It talks about the fact that the U.S. is a very rich nation, but the wealth is not inclusive. And for many, the American dream is increasingly out of reach. Well, there we go. We're talking about it's important, the recognition aspect of being a human. Some people look at it, if you're not a warrior, you might be an elitist and what's you gain your recognition by gathering so much wealth around yourself. So when you have a system that's geared in favor of those few who are gathering wealth around themselves, well, guess who's left out of the equation? And in order to get recognition, you know, you don't always do good things. So when you're placed in a condition of want, and you don't perceive there to be another way to address the situation and gain recognition appropriately, you might resort to other means, less appropriate means, of becoming famous or recognized. But in most people, that dilemma is going to cause a moral conflict. And what's likely to happen when you're faced with a significant moral conflict that you don't seem that you have a way to resolve is going to be a a good case of depression in all likelihood. And guess who's ready to jump on the bandwagon and help you out with that? Gigi's boot has talked about it. Those wonderful doctors that's getting a kickback from every kind of medication that they give you. Mm -hmm. And the pharmaceuticals. And now you're right back into that cycle again. Now you're, you're having people having adverse effects, some people, 
to these pharmaceuticals. So anyway, that, I'm not trying, I'm not going to try to dissect all this tonight, but obviously the issues surrounding these events, whether they're real or, you know, most of them are, I'm afraid, and others like them, has everything, it's very complex and has everything to do with our social system. And it has everything to do all the way down to our, our system of economy, our banking, our currency system. And that's where the bottom line is that no one wants to talk about. So they'll rather attack, to try to attack the so-called assault weapons. They want to throw a band-aid on it. Let's fix that when that's not really the issue. Anyway, I think we beat that up enough. Any time, anything you want to add to that, Cece's book? No, that's... Another no. article from the fifth column... Talk. Remember, we talked a little bit about free-range children not long ago. This poses the question, could your kids survive a downturn on their own? Something you have to think about if you have youngins or grandkids. And it asks the question, self-preservation is a primary factor in why most people, like us, spend time at least considering potentials and, and a downturn some of the things that we might need to do in the event that that happens. And certainly, if you have a family, that family is a motivation as to why you want, you want to do all these things. And the article talks about helicopter parents, those who are always hovering over their kids. And it talks about prepping mom and moms and dads always want to know where their kids are so in case something does happen, they can get home. But they also know better than to coddle and micromanage. And that's not, doesn't seem to be, well, I don't know. We seem to have such a strange mix right now. If kids that have no parents, effectively, then we have others who have too much parents. Both have bad outcomes, usually. To give us an example, when economic impact or the collapse uh, hit Venezuela, the one nearly 100% of the people or ignored, rather, by the mainstream media, ignored 100%. Children resorted to begging in the street, eating out of trash cans, stealing and turning to prostitution to survive, either because their parents could not provide for them, or they had been killed. Talks about kids being the ones who suffer the most during a long-term disaster. Unless, of course, you have some foundation nearby that's willing to take you into child prostitution and sell you somewhere. Anyway, it's another story. Because they're not big enough to take care of themselves. They lack skill sets. Why are they lacking all these skill sets? When Haiti was hit, thousands of children immediately became homeless and instantly turned many of them into orphans. And we know what happened to a lot of those. And the media won't talk about that. Same thing happened in Sri Lanka when a tsunami struck. This is the whole thing. You don't know when these things are going to happen, but statistically, they are going to happen. So what are some of the things you can do? You can f form this whole tribal concept with people in your own local neighborhoods, right? A mutual assistance group, if you will. People need to talk rather than sitting with their cell phones in their faces all day long in the virtual communication world. People need to talk. If you have this type of network, assistance network, if you will, the kids become less likely to have significant effects, even if you personally are killed. There's someone to help pick up the slack. So there's an article here, and I'm not going to talk much more about it. Feel free to study it. It's fairly long. Give some tips, some of the things one might consider. It is important, and we can talk about all these other things, school shootings and so forth. We still have old Mother Nature out there who, when we least expect it, likes to throw us a curveball. What are your thoughts on the, the kid thing, Gigi's boo, any? Well, I have mixed emotions on that. You know, I'm kind of over protect. I'm one of them hovers with my nieces and nephews and stuff like that. I mean, uh-uh. I'm not one. I'm, I'm one of them helicopter people. I'm, I know. I want to know where they are all the time. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that, but you have to allow them to... You have to allow them to grow up right. and spread their wings and and fly. Sometimes that's hard. Yeah. Oh, sure. It's hard. It's, my experience has been instilling the concept of cause and effect has probably been one of the most positive things. And both my kids will tell you that. 
that this whole, ever since they were small, learning this concept of cause and effect has really benefited them. And I think that's something that gets lost on on big systems. We tend to like to try to cover up the effects and continue with the causes, <laughs> which that's not a good recipe. It'll eventually come back to bite you hard. We're running kind of a little bit behind. I did want to talk a little bit about something else, but we're going to save that because we want to have some fun. I know we advertised that we're going to have some fun and we'll do something funny. And uh, let me see. Uh, let me open it up. Jeezy's booth going to handle this. But let me open it up with a little clip and see. Let me see how many people can recognize this clip. We're going to make it like it did 100 years ago. Like my granddaddy made it. Be tempered with water. What little liquor comes off of this? Right people to pay you $100 a gallon for it. Sure would. Oh, she's ready to put the cap on. Okay. See the steam coming out of it? That's, that's liquor I'm losing. Hell yeah, we don't lose no liquor. Oh, put that back on there. We ain't ready, we gotta put it back in there. As Bubba says, I'm gonna make some wiki today. Be the last damn run of wiki that I'm gonna ever fool with. Hell no, we ain't gonna lose no liquor today. <laughs> <laughs> What's that all about, Gigi's booth? That's the one and only popcorn setting. We talked about him some time back. Uh, on another channel years ago. Popcorn was a man of his own. I really admired him for doing what he wanted to do. To hear him tell, he had a famous another saying, he said, Jesus turned the water into wine. He said, I turned the water into whiskey. Anybody that has any Appalachian roots at all, like Gary and I or anybody else, they have known somebody or have been kin to somebody who has made moonshine whiskey. There's an art to it. It's not something just anybody can go into and do. And Popcorn had it down pat. He's probably the best-known moonshiner in the whole world. When We're going to talk a little bit about him, but he was born in 1946, and he died on March 16, 2009, with, by his own hands. He made moonshine. And he made good moonshine, and he taught a lot of people how to do it. He was, in 2007, I think it was, there was a fire on his property in Parrotsville, and it led to firefighters just covering 650 gallons of untaxed alcohol. So he was convicted and put on probation, and he did a couple of documentary films for History Channel. And in 2009, he won the Southeast Emmy Award. In 2008, he told an undercover federal officer that he had 500 gallons of moonshine in Tennessee and another 400 gallons in Maggie Valley that he was ready to sell. This led to a raid on his property by the good old ATF by none other than Jim Kavanaugh. I want you to remember that name. He was one of the ones that led the Waco siege. So Sutton, who used a public defender in the case, he pleaded guilty and he was sentenced to 18 months in federal pen for illegally distilling spirits and a possession of a firearm as a felon, 38 caliber. He had also been diagnosed with cancer and he asked the U.S. District Judge to allow him to serve his sentence under house arrest several petitions from other people, one of them being uh, Hank Williams Jr. came to his aide, Willie Nelson, and he said, you know, just commute his sentence, reduce it or commute it. But this time there was no go. The judge noted that he had still been under probation in Tennessee at the time of the federal raid. So his wife went to town that morning, and he cranked up his old three-jug, it was an old Fairline, Fairline Ford, green Fairline Ford. And the reason it had the name is it was because he said it was big enough to carry three jugs of whiskey in. Hooked it up, and he killed himself with carbon monoxide poisoning. Now, a lot of things went along the line of saying that he killed himself because he had cancer. No, he killed himself because he wasn't going to go by the United States government and what they said. Popcorn was a man that did what he wanted to do, lived what he wanted to do. 
minded his own business, made some money selling liquor, taught a lot of people how to make liquor, and he wasn't going to do it. And he had always told them, he said, before I'll go to jail, I'll kill myself. He said, I'm not going to jail. He said, any man ought to have free will and making a little whiskey. And he was right in a lot of ways. He was mountain right. And that's the thing about it. He had a daughter that wrote a book about him. Her name is Sky Sutton. She didn't know her father too well because her mother was kind of a stiff neck. And when she found out he was making liquor and everything, she left and went back to New England. So this daughter didn't know him as well as she would like to. And she said she spent her entire life gleaming knowledge about her father. And the name of her book was Daddy's Moonshine, the story of Marvin Popcorn Sutton. He was a little wiry feller, not big as all. He was just a little old bitty thing. And they said he was born and raised up there. And in fact, in Maggie Valley, which is about between here and the Eastern Reyes, and it's about a maybe... 90 miles from right where we're sitting now. And he made most of his moonshine there. But they've said so many times that the day he was called a living legend and the day he committed suicide, he put himself into the pages of American lore. He is sort of like the Paul Bunyan of the East Coast. His mother and daddy were good people, Bonnie and Vader. They were hardworking mountain people, and they lived in a little wooden house on the side of a mountain, and a stream went by. And his mom and daddy played music, and him and his sisters danced. His mom played the fiddle, and his daddy played the spoon. And somebody said that uh, popcorn danced like a dish rag. Well, to an outsider, he probably would look like a dish rag, but to an Appalachian, he'd be flat-footing and moving all over the place. And so... That's probably where he got that. Everybody that you've talked to, everybody that you've talked to, I'll say the United States government ought to left popcorn sitting alone. I agree. And I hate to say this, probably we got some FBI, ATF people listening, and I don't really care. But the Appalachian people don't like the federal government. Guarantee you that. We do our own thing, and we expect everybody to stay out of them hills and leave us alone. He was a very busy man, too. This is something else that I heard, that he was very busy, and he was always ready to show a mountain boy that was truly interested in how to make a steel, how to put it together, how to take it down, and move it. And he was very good at it, I guess because he was little. You know, a little skinny man could move around. He kind of stayed on the move all the time, and he had a lot of mountain stamina. Most of those mountain men do. They can just walk up the side of the mountain, and it never did bother him. And he was always doing something. If he wasn't moonshining, he was working in his junk shop. And that's where most of the out-of-towners met him. Now, I met him one time, and I did not know this till my mother brought this back to my attention. We were up in Maggie Valley. And he was up there walking around, and like I said, everybody knew him. And I shook his hand, and I remembered it after she began to talk to me. But, you know, a little child does forget things. And I just remember him being a little old bitty man and just a wiry fella. He's the only way I knew how to put it. He's real thin and wiry. And he knew how to build it, and he would take red clay, and he would put that with some creek water and make the best brick to put around that steel you'd ever seen in your life. It would take them a lot longer to build a steel and build it right than halfway do it because he said that steel's going to be there. Now, it's always said that he had his tomb rock where he wanted to be buried, and he didn't have the date, of course, because he didn't know exactly when that was going to happen. But the foot marker was what I put into the chat room last week and told y'all go look. It says popcorn Sutton said F you. And he bought a coffin and he kept that coffin in his living room. And that was the coffin that he was buried in. When he died, he was buried in the family cemetery. And people began to go 
and visit it. He was buried next to his mother and daddy and some of the other family. And they were afraid that somebody was going to steal his body. I think, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere I read there was an attempt to get his body. But he got out. They moved his body the second time and they buried him at his home place. And we're running out of time. So I'm just going to say, Popcorn, if you're listening to us, we love you. And there's plenty of people down here still making liquor. Poor old Tickle that's on the TV. He said something. It was so funny one time I was watching the Moonshiners on TV. And he said, we're getting ready to get tore up from the floor up. And that's about right. We've got some more stuff we're going to take up with you next week on the Appalachian. But I think I've kind of taken up. And I think our time's over with, Gary. Yeah, we're about at the end of the road here um, with all the alley barking. I know. I'm not going to be able to get that out of the archive, but that's okay. I'm just sorry. To, yeah, it's not your fault. Just have to put up with it. But anyway, there were some reasons that Popcorn decided to do the things that he did. And a lot of those reasons tied directly into what we were talking about earlier, with the concept of, well, one, of survival, but also of recognition. You have to bear in mind that even though that long history of the moonshine, and but as we've talked about before, one of the reasons behind it was the depressed costs of or prices for corn during the Depression, right, Gigi Spook? Yeah, it was easier to make the liquor. They could get more for their liquor mm-hmm. than they could for the corn that they sold. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the Depression being a direct result of our economic system. And remember, <laughs> a lot of people made a lot of money during Prohibition, making moonshine. Oh, one other thing. Yeah, Do let, you know let, why yeah, he, he, he turned out to be the winner in the end, but go ahead and say why. Yeah. He left a net worth of $13 million to his family. <laughs> $13 million. Well, Old Popcorn was doing something right. Yeah, that's right. So uh, those who, <laughs> those who uh, thought they were getting rid of all the crime of Popcorn and Sutton, so, well, guess what? <laughs> I guess poetic justice does exist. Anyway, I guess that's about it for us. Anything that you'd like to say, Gigi's Boo? Well, what I always say, be sure to take the road less travel. And remember, I love you big to my heart. Yeah, that's it for us this week. And we sure appreciate you tuning in. I hope you join us next week on the road less travel with Gary Ellen and Gigi's Boo on reallibertymedia.com. Coming up shortly in 10 years, a decade worth of service to the listeners. Take care. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.